But there's no doubt that in the age of social media, website ads, and voter databases, technological advancement is changing the landscape of politics. Right now, we have a panel of experts to explore the present and future impacts of this topic that could bring progress or um, regression to our country. All right, so I'm going to basically allow you guys to introduce yourself. So if you guys could go down the row and kind of um, introduce yourself. Um, but in general, I would like this, um, I was planning for this panel to be more um, conversational, so feel free during the discussion to bounce off of each other and discuss, um, and order doesn't matter, except for when we're introducing ourselves. Okay. Yeah. Good morning everyone, my name is Robin Kerner, and it's uh, lovely to see you all again because I was here last year giving the keynote speech. Um, some of you have kindly come up and said lovely things to me about that this morning, so thank you for that. Um, so it's good to be here. Uh, I'm a member of the faculty for an organization called Foundation for Economic Education. I am an author, I've written a book called um, uh, If You Can Keep It, Why We Nearly Lost It and How We Get It Back referring to the famous Franklin quote, which I hope you all know. Um, what I do is, other than writing, is I consult in the area of the selling, marketing, and importantly, branding of political ideas. And I do it motivated by getting people to hear folks that they may disagree with profoundly and probably hate or distrust. So I'm, a, I'm motivated by unification, you might say. Um, I am something, therefore, of an anti-partisan. And um, the, uh, the last thing I'll say is, I started in all of this in 2011 when I was responsible for creating the largest coalition for a Republican presidential candidate who was a very much an anti-establishment Republican presidential candidate. And I created that coalition out of mostly progressive and independent voters. Um, and uh, it was very interesting that that was even possible. So that's the spirit in which I work. But as I say, sales, marketing, and branding of political ideas. All right, so clearly we have a really awesome array of experiences. Um, and so what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about a topic really quickly, and you guys will have the opportunity to discuss it. Um, and then after that, after a few of those, we're going to open it up to audience questions in which you can also converse. Um, so the first topic is information accessibility. Speeches, radio, print media, radio, print media, and television were where most political information were dispersed in the old days, but now with the internet, information and misinformation is more abundant than ever. A tweet often replaces a news article in people's daily dosage of political or just civic information. Um, can you talk about the role of this in politics and whether it's good or bad and how it is shaping our, um, our country um, in our country's government and our country's public opinion. Thank you. So the question had the word information in it. Information, in a way, is much less important in politics, uh, taking that word literally, than we might like to believe. Uh, we have a guy in the White House called Donald Trump. How many people think that here, the most of his voters went to the Donald Trump website and thought, I'm just going to check where he is on the issues. Um, well, I'm eight, with him on 8 out of 12. Well, that's the majority. Well, then I'm a, I'm a rational Trump voter. No. No, it isn't about the information as much as, and I think this has been touched on, is what you're getting through these various technological media, does it reflect back to you, the voter, um, a concern you have, preferably a disaffection about something, preferably a sense of injustice about something, right? So um, if you're, I'm interested in kind of political insurgency, how to change the mainstream of politics from outside the mainstream. My opinion on the Democratic and Republican parties is pretty much right now pox on both their houses, right? And I think there is a feeling in America uh, you know, kind of that way, right, this is corrupt. So I'm interested in influencing the mainstream from outside the mainstream. And that usually means being able to let the voters know that you, the candidate, feel what they're feeling with respect to some kind of offense against a basic human sense of justice, 
but I'm reflecting back your, your feeling. I'm not telling you what I think, I'm telling you what you feel. And if it's about something that you think is unjust, and you identify all of your political, your other political options as causing, as making worse, then chances are I'll get you to make a vote for me, maybe even if I'm running for a party that you've never voted before, or, uh, or for no party at all. So um, when assessing these kind of questions about what technology can do, and you're gonna be asking this through your lives, for your, you know, your whole life, it's gonna be new technologies, and you're gonna ask this question, right? Remember that what always causes people to make different political decisions, because the technology is only going to be useful if it's a means to that end. If you don't have that framing, then you're not really getting it. Make sense? Vivian Guo from the International School of Bellevue. And there's the saying that, I think it's saying that any exposure is good exposure, and I was just wondering how you think expo bad exposure or good exposure plays into the success of a candidate's campaign. So I, I hate to have to use this guy's name twice in one panel, but Trump's the really good example of it, because he clearly made a choice, and he plays to win. He said outrageous things to earn massive media coverage, right? He was massively successful. We're talking an order of magnitude more than the Republican candidates who had a lot more name recognition than him, right? But what was he saying? He was saying things that he knew were alienating lots of people, right, at the same time. So there's kind of like two functions moving against each other. There's the increase in exposure to get his message out, right? So that's numbers working in his favor. But working against him is the increasing proportion of people who are obviously going to hate what they're hearing from him because he is like he, he offends. He got that number, those increasing media numbers, by offending, right? So which one won? Well, we know which one won. Again, the man's in the White House, right? Now, it's not obvious which way that might have gone, but it, it does speak to the, the two pillars of uh, of successful politics, which is. You've got to have the right message for enough people, right? Which is kind of what I was talking about earlier in my earlier talk here. Um, but then you've got to get the right message to enough of the people for whom it is the right message. And um, that what that looks like is a massive function of or with what jurisdiction are you in? What kinds of people are you talking to? Um, but anyway, yeah, there's a lot more to come. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm Jake, Jacob Herbold from the Overlake School, and uh, my question is, uh, you guys have spoken about technological advancement as in the media as if it's a necessity, especially just now when you guys were talking about Trump very heavily. I'm wondering, do you yes or no think this technology is a necessity to stay relevant or a natural evolution of the voting and campaigning system? I think you asked an either or question. Yeah. But I think it's a both and. Right? I think you were like, is this a need natural evolution? Well, technology evolves. And, uh, and then the other, the, the other part of that, the foil was, or do we have to adapt? Well, both. I mean, both. And, and by the way, um, yeah, it's interesting. As, as I'm hearing Sol say what he says, you know, I'm going to judge you for not uh, using virtual reality. And, and his point is well taken. But <laughs> my mother, is in her 70s. She lives in a rural English village, right? That ain't gonna work with her. This goes to adaptability, right? Um, the point about knocking on doors. Yeah, fantastic way. If I can see you whites of the eyes, but not every political race are you, if you're a candidate, in a position to actually do that. Maybe the numbers just, you can't get to the numbers. How many doors uh, did Donald Trump knock on your door? No. Right? So, so the means and the technologies that you were using are a function of so many things, right? You know, size of jurisdiction, demographics, uh, age, like 
the use of technology by the people that you're using technology to meet, right? My mother couldn't turn on an iPhone. Um, or a computer. I, know, I think she can do the kettle, because she always makes me tea. But you get the point, right? So, um, so it's, you know, a lot of these kind of either ors and something as complex as the, the things that we're discussing, they're both ands. They're nearly always both ands. But uh, thanks for the question. Thank you, guys. for speaking to us. Um, I'm really sorry for our limited time. Can we get another round of applause for our <laughs>